God, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to receive the message that you have for us this morning as we look to your word. Help us not only to hear it, but to put it into action, to put it into action with our hands and our feet, but especially with our hearts as we consider what it is to love one another in the way that Christ has loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take up a Bible if you haven't yet and turn with them, uh, with me in them, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're finally reaching the end of the second chapter of Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians this morning. We're looking at verses 17 through 20. These are verses that maybe you wouldn't pause to give a second thought to in your daily Bible reading. You just gloss right over them and uh, pass them by, but really I think these words would have meant a lot to the Thessalonians, and that's why we're going to spend some time looking at them this morning to see why it would have meant so much to them and why it should mean so much to us this morning. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, Paul writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. I've entitled this message, Terms of Endearment. Relationships are brought closer together. They're built up, really, they're strengthened when we use terms of endearment with people we love, expressing how we feel, how we think about one another. Usually terms of endearment, their, their names or their ways that we address our loved ones. I, I, I would hesitate to say pet names because that sounds a little derogatory, but terms of endearment are, are, are terms like sweetheart, darling, dearest, my love. If you were to scroll through my contacts in my phone, you wouldn't find my wife Trisha's name in it. You would find baby, and it's been that way for at least 12 years. I changed it once to her real name, and it just didn't look right. And so I've always used a term of endearment when I talk about Trisha. And so those kinds of words, they show a level of affection, a level of closeness in our relationships. Well, the Bible is flush with terms of endearment that believers use to express their hearts for one another. In our passage, Paul has used several words to bear his heart to the Thessalonians. He wears his heart on his sleeve for them. He doesn't hesitate to tell them how he feels about them, what he thinks about them. Remember, there were some in Thessalonica who were trying to convince this church, this new upstart church, that the apostle and his missionary team didn't really care for them. They had impure motives, they claimed, or they had less than honorable intentions with the Thessalonians. They would have claimed, if Paul loved you so much, then why did he leave you so quickly? And why hasn't he come back yet? Already in chapter 2, we've seen Paul defending his ministry to the Thessalonians. He's said that his motives are pure. He's said that his intentions are honorable. And he proves it here by demonstrating his heart for the Thessalonians at the end of chapter 2. Just look at how Paul addresses the Thessalonians in these verses. He calls them brothers. Maybe your translation has brothers and sisters. That's implied they're dear to him like family the family of god as we've just sung he calls them our hope our joy our crown of boasting our glory and joy these are indeed terms of endearment that paul is using clearly paul cared for these believers in thessalonica he longed for them and he loved them and that's what we're looking at today in these verses believers have a powerful attraction to and affection for one another. Now, let me explain those two words, attraction and affection, lest you get the wrong impression. By attraction, I'm not just talking about physical appeal, like you would be drawn to somebody who who looks and smells nice. By attraction, I mean that believers should have a powerful longing to be with one another, to be together. We should be drawn to one another like magnets. Something should feel off and wrong when we're not together, like something has been disrupted in the connection between us. We should feel a holy discontent when we're apart. That's how Paul felt when he's apart from the Thessalonians. He longed to be back with them in the city of Thessalonica. His heart ached to see them face to face. He felt a fierce, powerful attraction to them from quite a distance. 
And then by affection, I mean that believers should have a powerful love for one another. Actually, maybe I should say that believers must have a powerful love for one another because loving one another is a command from Christ for his people to obey. It's not optional. It's not a suggestion. This is a requirement of God's family. While the word love is not ever used here in these verses from Paul to the Thessalonians, we we certainly see that he deeply loved these believers in Thessalonica. He demonstrates his longing. He demonstrates his love and heart for the Thessalonians, which really serves as a model for us to imitate as well as to uh, reflect toward one another in this place, in this church. And so I want to call attention in these verses, these four verses, to four features that I saw during the week in my study. As we, as we look at these four features, consider how they relate either to Paul's attraction to the Thessalonians or his affection to these believers in Thessalonica. The first feature that I want to point out is in the first half of verse 17, painful separation, painful separation. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time in person, not in heart. Torn away is the verb. It pictures a painful separation that Paul and Silvanus both felt as they're away from the the Thessalonians. This is one of those Greek words that if I showed it to you, you'd be able to translate it for me. In fact, I have put it up on the screen for you. The verb is aporphanizo. It's a verb with a prefix attached to the front of it. The prefix at the front, it's the preposition in Greek apo, meaning away from, and the verb is orphanidzo. So you can guess what that verb means. It means to make an orphan or to deprive a child of their parents. It was also a verb that was used generically in the Greek world of even parents who would be bereft of their children. So it could be used interchangeably of children who have lost their parents or parents who have lost their children. And so this verb already denotes a very painful experience. Orphanidzo by itself denotes a painful separation, but this prefix just intensifies and magnifies, amplifies the power of this verb. Op orphanizo, it signifies this violent rupture, this separation that has occurred in a relationship. The word depicts a a child whose parents have been taken from them or a couple who has lost their children because they've been stripped from their arms. If you've watched some World War II movies that portray Nazi concentration camps, I think you'll understand what this kind of separation looks like. Jewish parents and children, they were violently torn apart from one another by the Nazis in these camps, sometimes never to see one another again. And so thus, I think the ESV appropriately translates this verb as torn away. Already in this chapter, we've seen how Paul has likened he and Silvanus to a spiritual mother and father to the Thessalonians. They were like a nursing mother gently and tenderly caring for the Thessalonians when they were there. They were like a father speaking words of encouragement and exhortation to their brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. They were spiritual father and mother to these believers, and the Thessalonians were their spiritual children. But they'd been torn away from them. Paul says, in person, not in heart. And so Paul is picturing his heart being torn out of his chest, as it were, to remain in the city of Thessalonica while his body is forced from town to town by his opponents, whether they be the Jews uh, chasing him out or the civil authorities of Thessalonica, it doesn't matter. His heart remains in Thessalonica. Made me think of that Tony Bennett song. In 1962, he came out with the song, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Some of you are far too young to know that song. Bennett sings about how he travels all over the world. He goes to places like Paris, Rome, Manhattan, but all of those places hold no special meaning to him. And so he sings, I left my heart in San Francisco, high on a hill it calls to me, to be where little cable cars climb halfway to the stars, and the morning fog will chill the air. My love waits there in San Francisco, above the blue and windy sea. When I come home to you, San Francisco, your golden sun will shine on me. Now, Tony Bennett's heart was aching for the place of San Francisco, for the city itself. His heart was in San Francisco. The Apostle Paul, I think, could sing in some sense, I left my heart in Thessalonica, except Paul's heart doesn't ache for the place or for the city itself. Paul's heart ached for the people, for the church, for the Christians in Thessalonica. So feature number one, painful separation. They had been torn away 
from the people they dearly, deeply loved, who had become spiritual children to them. Now, feature number two comes in the rest of verse 17 and into the first half of verse 18, intense ambition, intense ambition. Paul continues, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again. So Paul's ambition, his singular goal, it appears here as he's expressing it to the Thessalonians, was to get back to them. Notice the words that Paul is piling up to describe the efforts that he and Silvanus made to be reunited with their spiritual children. And each of these words really describes an intense ambition that he and Silvanus had. So it's worth lingering over these words, each of them. Paul begins, we endeavored. The root of this word means haste. It speaks of an intensity of purpose followed by an intensity of effort toward the realization of that purpose. The idea is that the missionaries, they're putting in maximum effort. They're sparing no expense, no resources in order to get back to the Thessalonians. They're hurrying on. They're trying to hasten back to Thessalonica. They made it their one goal, and they strove with all their might to achieve this goal, to get back to Thessalonica. Paul adds, the more eagerly, comes across as two words in English, but it's just one word in Greek. The word means to a greater degree or to an extent that is more than just common or normal. So Paul and Silvanus, they went above and beyond their call of duty. They took extraordinary measures in their attempt to get back to the Thessalonians. And with great desire, Paul says next. Paul could have just said the word desire here. The word desire in Greek itself already describes an intense emotion, an intense craving, an overwhelming longing, or a fierce passion. So by adding great to the front of it, Paul keeps heaping up superlatives, one on top of the other. This is a superabundant desire that has fueled their extreme endeavor to get back to the city. They, they take extraordinary measures to get back to Thessalonica. We wanted to come to you, Paul goes on to write in verse 18. Again, this expresses their, their strong desire, their will to get back to the church. Paul then interjects himself into the equation, saying, I, Paul. Previously, Paul had been writing in the plural, we were torn away from you. We endeavored. We wanted to come to you. Now, just in case the Thessalonians got the impression that this return trip to the city was only Sylvanus's idea and not Paul's, Paul is correcting that, saying, no, 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 I wanted to come to you. It's not that Sylvanus is making plans, that he's got his bags packed, and he just wanted me to come in the passenger seat to keep him company. This is really what I wanted all along, too. Paul is saying, I had all my bags packed. I was ready to go. I had booked my flight. I even made it to the terminal at one point. Paul was ready for this reunion just as much as Sylvanus was. Finally, notice the words again and again at the end Uh, there of verse 18. That is, time and again, repeatedly, more than once, many times, Silvanus and Paul had attempted to get back to the Thessalonians. This wasn't a one-and-done kind of effort on their part, as if the first attempt failed and they just, well, well, let's just call it quits. Many times, many days, and in many different ways and on different many occasions, they had tried to come. All of these superlatives, all these intensifiers, they're just heaped on top of each other, piled up one after the other to picture the powerful attraction that Paul had for the Thessalonians. He was drawn to them. There was a mighty magnetism between him and them. His heart longed to return to them because he deeply loved them. Do you have this kind of longing and love for your fellow Christians in this church? Somebody once said, if absence makes the heart grow fonder, then some Christians must really love the church. In other words, there are some Christians who would rather be absent from the saints rather than present with the saints to express their affection, if that's possible. When you're separated from this body after you maybe leave church today or maybe you go on a two-week vacation across the country, does your heart ache or do you breathe a sigh of relief when you're away from this body? Are you eager to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ, or are you counting the seconds until you can get away? Do you come to church on Sundays or attend your small group throughout the week, or do you go to Bible study just to check off your religious obligations, or do you go because you truly love Christ's people? Think about this. Christ really loves his church. 
There are several different images or pictures of how the church is described in the New Testament. Here are just three, described as a bride, a body, and a building. Christ's bride, Christ's body, Christ's building. The church is called the bride of Christ. In Ephesians, Paul explains how Christ demonstrated his love for his bride. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Ephesians 5, 25. So don't you think if Christ so loves his bride in that way, that we should too? Actually, we must. As I said, this is a commandment from Jesus Christ to his church. The bride must love one another. You are either obeying that command or you are disobeying that command. There's no middle ground. Also, the church is likened to Christ's body. Christ is the head. We are the body. A body has many parts and many members, Paul says to the Corinthians. Meaning, if one of us is separated or is suffering or is torn away from the rest of the body, we should all feel it. That's how close-knit we are together. Not only do we rely on one another, but we complete one another. The Spirit of God has given us all gifts that complement one another in various ways so that the church will be built up in love to grow into the fullness of maturity in Christ Jesus. And that brings me to the third picture of the church, where Christ's bride, where Christ's body, we're also likened to Christ's building. The Apostle Peter calls us living stones, a spiritual house, being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2.5. That means that we should feel incomplete if some of the bricks or stones are missing from the structure. To be a complete building, we need every brick and stone in its place, built on the foundation of the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus being our cornerstone. Let's get back on track now. Paul has an intense commitment and love for this Thessalonian church. It pained his heart to be away from him. He did everything that he could to to come back to them, to see them face to face. And we know that Paul is doing all he can to get back to Thessalonica because the only thing that was going to stop his efforts is feature number three, satanic opposition. Satanic opposition. We wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. The only thing that's going to keep him from the Thessalonians is Satan. We understand Satan to be a name in the Bible, but really it's more of a descriptor of who he is and what he does. Satan simply means the adversary. I could tell you everything you need to know about this supernatural being that we call Satan or the devil. He is God's adversary. He's against God and God's plan and God's people. He's Christ's adversary, therefore he's the church's adversary, and indeed he is even the adversary of all mankind. Friends, whether you're a Christian or not, You need to know that there is a supernatural personal being in the universe called Satan, older than all humanity, who is actively at work in the world today and whose singular purpose is to destroy you with him forever. You need to know also that while Satan is not omnipotent, all-powerful, he is extremely powerful. He's not omniscient, but he is extraordinarily crafty and cunning. He's not omnipresent, and yet he has minions, puppets, and workers everywhere on the face of this planet. They pop up like weeds. Martin Luther was right when he penned this line in his famous hymn, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. So we can see how Satan's great craft and power are at work against the missionaries, against Paul and Silvanus in this passage. Paul says, Satan hindered us. That word hinder means to obstruct or prevent, to thwart or to interrupt, to stop or to block. In the ancient Greek world, the word hinder was actually a military term. It refers to an army digging pits and trenches, putting up barriers, forming blockades to prevent an enemy army from traveling or advancing their troops, their horses, their war machines against the army. Sometimes an army would take such extreme measures to hinder the enemy's advance by tearing up the brick or the stone road behind them, making normal movement impossible, slowing the enemy down to a crawl, forcing them to take a detour, or maybe just stopping them altogether, forcing them to go home. The word was also used in athletic events as an athletic term. Paul 
wrote this letter to the Thessalonians while he's stationed and doing ministry in the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was the home of the Isthmian Games. Uh, every two years, these games would occur, sandwiching the Olympic Games in Greece. Uh, and so the, the Greek word for hinder here was used for a runner in these games, in a foot race, who would cut into a competitor's lane, slowing that other runner down, or maybe even causing that runner to, to stumble and fall so that that runner couldn't complete the race and cross the finish line. And so Paul uses the same word hinder in his letter in the same way uh, to the Galatians. In Galatians 5, 7, the ESV puts it this way, you were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? And the NIV translates it this way, you were running a good race, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? If you took track or uh, cross country in high school or college, you know exactly what this word is all about. An opponent breaking in, cutting you off, causing you to trip and stumble so that you can't run the race as you had planned. So picture the spiritual equivalent of pits, of trenches, of barriers, of blockades, of torn up roads, or an opponent crossing over into your lane to trip up the runner. And that's what Satan is doing to hinder Paul and Silvanus from getting back to Thessalonica. The question on my mind this week was, how did Satan hinder Paul exactly? Paul doesn't specify. We can only speculate. In the immediate context, as we saw last week, perhaps the opposition of the Jews is what Paul had in mind when he's speaking here of Satan hindering him. In fact, a similar word is used just a few verses earlier, as we saw last week, of the Jews hindering the gospel from going to the Gentiles. So perhaps Paul had in mind those Jews who were driving him and Silvanus from town to town, out of Thessalonica, over to Berea, then out of Berea, down to Athens, and then from Athens over to Corinth. Also could refer to uh, the Thessalonian uh, civil authorities who had forced the missionaries out of town. They were preaching Christ as king. They only knew Caesar as king, and that was an offensive message to them to say that Christ is king. So maybe they're blockading roads, forcing uh, the missionaries to stay out of the city somehow. We also know, as I, I said earlier, that Paul is ministering at this time in Corinth, and so maybe a likely explanation of how Satan is hindering Paul was a thorn in the flesh. Listen to how Paul described this thorn in the flesh in his second letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, verse uh, 7 of chapter 12, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now, we don't know also what this thorn in the flesh was that was hindering Paul here. It could have been a physical illness. Maybe it was a mental illness. Maybe it was an actual person that had come along and made his ministry difficult. Or maybe it was some other handicap that was being brought upon Paul, spiritual or physical, uh, to dose out a measure of humility to Paul. Whatever it was, the bottom line is we don't know how Satan is hindering Paul from coming back to Thessalonica, but we do know he is, and that Paul perceived it that way, that Satan is against him from doing the Lord's work back in Thessalonica. Satan works hard to hinder the hard work of the Lord's servants. Don't let that discourage you. If you feel the opposition of Satan, that's good news for you. If, if Satan is hindering you, take heart, because it means that you're on the Lord's side, doing the Lord's work, and in the Lord's strength, you can be confident that you'll overcome the adversary in the Lord's time. On the other hand, if you don't ever feel the ire and the interruption of Satan in your ministry, could it be that he's not as concerned with what you're doing for the Lord? So how exactly did Paul know that it was Satan preventing him from going to Thessalonica? I think it all boils down to what Paul says again to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 2.11, we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul knew Satan's tactics, Satan's schemes, Satan's designs and devices. Whatever this hindrance was, God was sovereign over it, and Paul is exactly where he needs to be. Paul is needed more in Corinth than he is in Thessalonica. Timothy could go to Thessalonica, and in fact, we'll see next week that Paul sends him on his way to Thessalonica in his place. But Corinth if you don't know anything about the city of Corinth and, and the church that was being established there, they are full of sin and scandal. Satan was indeed at work in that church, and that place needed the apostle Paul. God had Paul where he wanted him. So what's the takeaway? Two things. Satan seeks to hinder the, the Lord's work done by the Lord's servants. That's takeaway number one. 
You can expect opposition in your work for the Lord and trust Christ during that opposition to overcome the opposition. Luther's hymn continues, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. The lesson then is to confide in the strength of the Lord of hosts when you are facing the opposition of Satan. Second, one of the ways that Satan seeks to harm us is by hindering us from gathering together with God's people. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to know that the only thing that was keeping him from them was the craft and the power of Satan hindering him. Friends, that's the best excuse for not being with God's people, whether it's for worship or for fellowship or for discipleship. Christian, Satan knows that you and I are at our weakest when we are alone and away from our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the strategy of any, any predator with their prey out in the wild. The wolf separates the sheep from the flock. The lion cuts off the gazelle from going back to the herd. Satan knows that you and I are stronger when we are together. After all, Jesus promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. So the church gathered makes the devil tremble. The church scattered makes the devil rejoice. Well, there's one more feature that I want to bring out in these verses that we're looking at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This fourth feature is in verses 19 and 20, where we see Paul's eternal exaltation. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 through 20. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. The New American Standard puts it this way. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Paul exalted in his spiritual children. Exalt means to be extremely joyful. Our English word comes from a Latin word that means to leap up. So I suppose you could paraphrase this as Paul saying he was jumping for joy about these Thessalonians. That's the language of a proud parent with their child. The Thessalonians were Paul's pride and joy. He was proud of their faith and their spiritual progress. He gushed about them with everyone that he met. And everyone that he met, as we saw back in chapter 1, had something positive to say about the Thessalonians too. Before Paul could even tell others about the Thessalonians, others were coming to him to tell him about the Thessalonians. Imagine that someone came to the apostle near the end of his life and asked, Paul, you've been tortured, you've been beaten, you've been left for dead, stranded by friends, slandered by enemies, falsely accused, you've been imprisoned and shamefully treated everywhere you go. What's in it for you? Why do you keep going through this? Why do you keep doing this? What's your pay? A missionary was once asked about his salary and his compensation for his ministry. The inquirer knew that it couldn't have been much, and he wanted to know why this skilled missionary would risk his neck, he would face countless threats, endure rejection from so many around the world for so little reward or pay. The missionary pulled out a well-worn letter from his pocket. It was apparent that this missionary had brought that letter out on many occasions, unfolded it, and read it either to himself or to others on different occasions. And so he read two lines from the letter aloud to the inquirer. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Every morning I kneel in prayer, thanking God that he directed you to me and for everything that God's done for me through you. And then the missionary looked up, looked the other man in the eyes and said, that's my pay. Remember now, there are people in Thessalonica who are saying to the believers in Thessalonica, Paul's only in it for the money. He's all about greed and his own glory. Paul's motives, they're not pure. His intentions, they're less than honorable. He wants glory, he wants fame, he wants fortune. He really doesn't care about you. He doesn't love you. How does Paul answer these attacks? What kept him going through his persecution as he's being driven out of Thessalonica, then to Berea, then to Athens, then to Corinth? Paul, what's in it for you? Paul essentially answers in these verses, Thessalonians, I'm in it for you. I'm in it for the day when I get to hand you over to Jesus when he comes with joy. And I get to know that we can be forever with the Lord together. That's my pay. You are my pride and my joy. 
I'm not sure that there's a greater reward for a minister than to be able to hand the sheep over to the chief shepherd on that day, to look at all the souls who are going to be forever with the Lord because the minister has shared with them the gospel and his very life. A pastor's eternal crown, it's not made up of gold and diamonds, precious jewels, but of the precious souls under his charge that he has cared for, that he's loved, and who have remained faithful to the end to the Lord, all because of his ministry to them. Let me close by asking one question and providing three answers as a form of application for us from these verses. Here's the question. How can you and I cultivate an attraction to and an affection for one another like Paul had for the Thessalonians? How can we long for, how can we love one another like Paul longed and loved the Thessalonians? Here are my three answers. Prioritize being together as often as you can. Pour yourself into one another as much as you can. And praise one another's spiritual progress as best you can. Prioritize being together as often as you can. If one of Satan's great tactics is to separate the sheep and to keep the the saints scattered and from rather regularly gathering together, then shouldn't we be striving all the more purposely to be together as much as we can? This is going to mean that we'll need to clear our schedules. We'll need to reevaluate what, what needs to be cut or eliminated in our daily routine. Make gathering for Sunday worship of utmost importance. Join one of our four small groups that meet throughout the week. Meet throughout the week with brothers and sisters in an informal way. Go fishing, go golfing, go drink coffee together. Attend a Bible study with one another. Get plugged in. Become a member of this church. Make being with the family of God a priority in your life. Satan hates it when the church is gathered. Number two, pour yourself into one another as much as you can. And that's going to happen best through regular fellowship and discipleship relationship opportunities that you have throughout the week. Paul told the Thessalonians earlier in chapter two, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you would become very dear to us. So those seem to be the two fundamentals of loving one another the best. You share the gospel and you share your life with those you love. That's how you know that someone is very dear to you. They've shared the gospel with you. They're sharing their life with you. And then third, praise one another's spiritual progress as best you can. Commend them. Pat them on the back for the progress they're making in their spiritual life. Why else would Paul say to the Thessalonians, you are our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting. You are our glory and joy. I think he's delighted to see them growing in Christ, to hear good news that the devil isn't tempting them away from the faith, that they're standing strong. This is why we should use terms of endearment with one another. Praise one another so as to prod one another on in love to the great day when we will all meet the Lord and be with him together in the great family reunion. Let the world know that we are Christ's disciples by our longing to be together and our love for one another. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize that we can only love in this way because you loved us first. First, Lord, we need to love you. And out of that love for you, we will love one another. Lord, we desire to love the people that you have redeemed by grace, through faith, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to obey the scriptures we've heard this morning, to respond to your voice to be attracted more to one another, drawn together in a powerful bond of love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.